Okay, let's ferment these pepperoncinis. First thing I'm gonna do is sanitize my jar. So I have a jar here and a half inch of water just sitting on the bottom of the pot. If you're gonna use a used seal like this, you wanna check it for scratches. Like this actually has some big scratches on there um, and a little rust, so I'm gonna pick a different lid. But when I get the lid I want, and you can use new lids too, that's the safest. I'm just gonna pop this on here and boil this for like 10 or 15 minutes but I'm gonna use this between the burner and the pot. Now you don't necessarily have to do that, but I have it, so I'm gonna do it because it's a little bit safer, you know, less harsh heat like right against the bottom of the jar. But if you bring the heat up slowly, it's probably okay just to, to set it in there. I mean, I've done it a lot. So yeah, using that heat spreader just also allows me to turn the heat up all the way right off the bat. First thing I'm gonna do with these is rinse them in clean water. Quite a few of these peppers have blossom end rot. It doesn't show up on peppers the same as it does on tomatoes. You'll just see these dead brown necrotic spots on the sides of the peppers. The other thing we're looking for is this, remnants of the original blossom dried up on here. Sometimes they'll be like stuck on the end of the pepper. There's some right there. So we wanna get rid of all that stuff. But a particular problem with fermenting peppers is that they're hollow and they're full of air. So they float. We want to get brine into them. Stab through the pepper and then cut down maybe like, so there's like a one inch or maybe three quarter inch slit there. If it wasn't for the hollow thing, pickling these peppers would be about as easy as making a batch of salad dressing. I mean, it's really not that hard. And these peppers in particular, I mean, they're long and weird shaped, but they're pretty flexible. So I can really just get my fist in here and cram them down. About when to pick these. This one looks about right, and this one looks overdone. So what I've noticed is you want to get them near or at full sized, but they're still wrinkly and kind of lean looking. And then when they get bigger, they get shinier and the wrinkles fill out and puff up a little bit. So I don't know, it's pretty subtle. I'm not sure if you can see the difference, but there's an obvious difference to me. And this one's on the old side, so it's gonna be tough. It's gonna have like a tougher skin. You know, I don't particularly like them that way, so I try to get them when they're pretty young. And you don't wanna store them around too long. Like if I were to pick a batch and then wait for another batch to ripen, you know, that's too long. So it looks like I'm barely gonna make it here, but I'm just gonna keep cramming and cramming. Once the brine works on these, they're gonna get real soft and they'll pack way down. I like to ferment in mason jars with lids you'll be able to just seal the peppers up when they're done fermenting and just leave them at room temperature even. I prefer to store them in the fridge, but I've stored these over a year at room temperature, pop them open and they're perfectly good. So as the fermentation is going, it's pushing the air out the top of the jar constantly. And what it's replacing it, what it's pushing it out with is carbon dioxide. So if you never open this at any point all the way when the fermentation's done, and let in a bunch of air, you know, this blank of carbon dioxide is sitting in there and that will preserve them pretty well. Okay, the formula I use is two cups of water to one tablespoon of salt, but I've been cutting the salt back just a little bit lately. And I have like a wooden tamper here. You can use your fingers too. I'm just gonna press on this a little bit to get some of that liquid to get into the peppers and mostly to just get the air between the peppers out. You know, like down in the jar, there's still air trapped down there. These are old school canning jar lids just from, you know, mason jars like this. I have a little rubber seal. And these work pretty good for just keeping that food below the, the liquid line a little bit. Screw that down very lightly. So this is gonna require some management and especially with peppers because again, they have to kind of fill partially with liquid. So this liquid level is gonna drop here. But even with any ferment like this that you're using this system, you have to manage how tight this is and change it at some point. So what I'm gonna do is just barely tap that snug. Like it, when I just feel it catch and leave it like that later. And then again, tomorrow morning, I'm just gonna take this again and pack this a little bit. And you'll see like a bunch of air will come out of the peppers later on. So I'm gonna do one more thing here. If you have a successful ferment that you like and it turned out really good, I'm just gonna take that little bit of starter fluid there to uh, introduce some of the right bacteria. Just a small amount of sugar, maybe like a teaspoon or less. 
And that's just gonna provide immediate food that's super easy for that bacteria to kick off on. And it's gonna start fermenting right away and proliferating those bacteria that I want to proliferate in there. So that sugar will get used up by probably tomorrow morning. It's ideal to ferment this stuff at like, you know, not too hot of a temperature, kind of 70 degrees or something like that probably. Okay, so again, I'm gonna just take this and I'm gonna go snap and just when I feel it catch just right there, that's where I wanna leave it because that's gonna allow the air in carbon dioxide to escape really easily. If I tighten this down too far, for instance, what's gonna happen is it's gonna build up pressure. What happens when it builds up pressure is the liquid's gonna rise and then the liquid's gonna start spilling out. And then when I wanna store it, I'll just snug it down really hard. Looks like it's already starting to ferment. That's because it's very warm and I put sugar and starter in it. Not necessary. You don't have to put starter. The bacteria is in the peppers or on them or something. So I just want to do that three or four times before I finally put it aside. I've done it once already earlier and then just now and I'll do it again at least once in the morning. Okay, it's the next day and uh, there's plenty of air has been pressed out of the peppers. Now it's just producing carbon dioxide. I took out these little glass lids that I had put in there and replaced it with this weight that I remembered uh, my mom had given me this little weight. So this is made just for this purpose. It looks like the liquid's a little bit low and all I'm gonna do is just top it off with just a little bit of water. So I want about a half inch of space here of you know air space on the top. So what I'll do now is I'm just gonna take this and do my, you know, barely starting to snug down thing. Depending on the weather, I'm just gonna keep looking at it for the color of the peppers here to change from this bright green color to like more of a pale yellow color. And the brine, I don't know if you can probably can't see it, but it's already becoming cloudy. The brine's gonna become more cloudy. You might even see like a little white sediment settling on the peppers themselves. And when I just feel like it's at the right point and it's mostly finished, fermenting but there's probably just a little bit more fermenting to go then I'll just take this and snug it down actually pretty tight and I will not open that again until I'm ready to eat the peppers. If I open it even once it's going to flood with air the fermentation is going to be over so there's no more carbon dioxide being formed and pushing out that air and then stuff can grow. So in a lot of ferments what people will do is they'll just leave this super loose just like set on there or maybe put on a piece of cloth so bugs can't get in and then just let it ferment. As long as the food is under the, the liquid and you don't leave it for too long, that works. But you'll get this white scum and everyone will be like, oh, the white scum is just normal, it's fine. It, you know, just skim it off. Well, if you don't let any air in and you have carbon dioxide constantly moving out, you get none of that scum. And as far as I'm concerned, that's a much superior way to approach this. Now, traditionally, people did not have that option because they didn't have an easy way to make an airlock. Now we literally buy food in jars all the time, like your spaghetti sauce or whatever, that come with a, a lid that serves as an airlock. I mean, an airlock lets stuff out, but not back in. So this technology is widely available to us. It's everywhere, and it's really easy to just, you know, change the way you manage this and eliminate that problem. That's why this system is superior to a lot of like other ways of doing this. I've done it for years and like hundreds of jars of food and you do get, you know, failures sometimes, but it just has to do more with what's in there. And this is really about establishing the right bacteria that you want and reducing competition from other bacteria, right? It's like who gets in there first? What are the conditions for their growth? And how fast do they pr proliferate to like suppress um, and dominate the other stuff in there that you don't want to grow? All right, so here's our pepperoncini. As you can see, I've eaten a lot of them already because I've been eating a lot of sandwiches. It's summertime, I have these big, beautiful tomatoes. And I love sandwiches. As you can see, they're a nice golden color now. They're delicious, clean, acidic, yummy. So just to tie this video up, I wanna make sure that people understand the benefits of this system. Now this jar, I just started eating right away, so I wasn't gonna store it, so it's not a big deal if I open it. This is a jar that I actually put into storage, and this has that blanket of carbon dioxide in there, so it's gonna keep at room temperature. So you can think of it as a difference between like a subsistence mindset and just uh, let's make a few 
you know, this and eat it right away. If I grow, say, 10 or 12 plants, which is going to provide, you know, maybe enough to last through the whole year, depending on how many I eat, I can't eat them all right away. It's going to be gallons. Uh, how do I fit those in my fridge and store them in the fridge, right? Because I'm able to seal these up with that nice blanket of carbon dioxide and keep them at room temperature, now we're into the subsistence zone. So I'm going to open this because I'm just going to eat it, you know, pretty soon. Um, just to show you something. Oops. A little bit of pressure left, so that just means that I sealed it before it was finished fermenting, or maybe a little bit too early. Getting some spill over here. It's basically like pepper soda. Yeah, there's quite a bit in there. As you can see, there's a ton of pressure in here, and the jar didn't crack or anything. I've never had a jar crack doing this. I've had the metal lids literally buckle and not you know, not fail. I'm just kind of letting the pressure off easy so we don't lose too much of this liquid. Okay, but what I wanted to point out, you can't see it now, but the because the, the gas is coming out and raising the liquid level, but these peppers on the top were not submerged. They were not below the liquid. If you do that and there's any air in there, these peppers are gonna discolor and they're going to spoil. When you let air in, it allows organisms to grow, yeast and bacteria, whatever it is, that will actually spoil the whole ferment eventually. From what I understand, it's because they actually consume the lactic acid that is created by the ferment as maybe they metabolize it as food or something, and they'll actually shift the pH of the entire liquid eventually towards more and more alkaline right? And then the stuff won't keep and it'll spoil. But either way, if the peppers are not submerged and you don't have that neutral carbon dioxide, right? This is an inert gas. If you don't have that on the surface, these peppers will discolor. But these were actually exposed like maybe, you know, three quarters of an inch of peppers on the top were exposed and they did not spoil. Okay, so I just wanted to point that out. And this, this system has problems. Uh, these lids tend to rust when you get this kind of spill over, even no matter how carefully you manage it, which is difficult to figure out exactly how to manage it, eventually the salt is gonna start rusting these lids because they're not really coated that well. And that can eventually lead to contamination. If you open one of these a year later and there might be a bunch of rust around here, you have to take that lid off very carefully, wipe it very carefully because any rust that gets in here is gonna discolor and create off flavors in there. So this is not a perfect system I have ideas about creating a much better system, but I don't have time and energy to deal with it now, and I don't want to go into that here. So I used to do this with these metal lids. This one's very rusted, like I can see, literally see light through the side of this uh, ring here, and it really destroys them very quickly. They rust really badly all around here, but you can use them. I've used them a lot, but I much prefer these plastic lids. But these plastic lids will not create enough of a seal. So you can add like a, a silicone ring in here. You can buy these little, you know, silicone rings. I'll show you one. I don't have any that are this size, but you can get these and they'll actually form a seal. So you could just use this and the plastic lid. So one concern of mine in particular is exposure to plastics. We're finding out more and more how dangerous these plastics are and how the cumulative exposure to plastics and the chemicals in plastics are causing major health problems, like really serious stuff. The problem is though that these are coated with a plastic, right? They're supposedly BPA free, but they have other chemicals, you know, that are probably just as bad or are also bad. These are plastic. Again, you can get those BPA free, but same problem. The trick would be to come up with a system that doesn't use any plastic or at least keeps it to a bare minimum. But anyway, for now, this works. I've done it a lot. Uh, lots of delicious pepperoncini. I've made just gallons and gallons and gallons and gallons of these things. Other good foods to do this way are green beans are delicious. They ferment really well. They stay nice and crisp. You can do mixed vegetables like cauliflower, carrots, celery is a favorite of mine. Uh, experiment and you can use the same formula, same system, except it, with the peppers you have to do this slicing thing and try to get the liquid into the peppers and that's the only real difference. If you're trying to grow enough to eat for a long time, like really get through the year or something, you know, it's going to be six to a dozen plants probably. 